Good morning, Northland. Good morning. Hello. I'm so glad you're here. Welcome into these rooms and welcome to our church family online as well. As you know, we have been going through the four arms of our church, connect, cultivate, care, and this week is the last week of that series and its commission. So as we begin, I want to I want to read the words of Paul in 2 Corinthians 10, 13. We, however, will not boast beyond proper limits, but will confine our boasting to the sphere of service God himself has assigned to us, a sphere that also includes you. In this verse, Paul reminds us to remain faithful and obedient in carrying out our mission to engage our neighbors and nations with the good news. So with that, would you please stand? And may our worship this morning be a reflection of his grace and glory.
So this is the final week of our Engage series, and this week we're talking about our fourth C, our fourth uh, arm of ministry here at Northland, which is commission. 
And it's referring to Jesus' command to go and tell the good news of his coming and to make disciples of the whole world, of all nations. So let's worship the Lord in our own hearts and then proclaim his kingship to one another, beholding the wonder of his love for us so that we are strengthened and can lead this place to be salt and light in a world who so desperately needs it. And right now we're going to worship and sing as Danny and Casey lead us in this familiar song. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son wretch his treasure how great the pain of searing loss the father turns his face away as the wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory sin upon his shoulders ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished his dying breath has brought me life I know Let's go to God, church. Why should I gain from His reward? ¿Por qué debería ganar de su recompensa? I cannot give an answer. No puedo dar una respuesta. But this I know with all my heart. Pero esto lo sé con todo mi corazón. His wounds have paid my ransom. Sus heridas han pagado mi rescate. High King of Heaven, the earth is yours and everything within it. Alto Rey del Cielo, la tierra es tuya y todo lo que hay dentro de ella. And that you are mindful of us is impossibly wonderful. Que seas consciente de nosotros es increíblemente maravilloso. So hear our gratitude right now. Escucha nuestra gratitud ahora mismo. Hear our praise right now. Nuestros elogios ahora mismo para ti. To you are all in all. Para ti nuestro todo en general. And the Church of God said, 
Y la iglesia dijo, Amén. Before you take a seat, as you know, we have been doing the weekly jingles and we've had the Andrews sisters, we had some 90s, we had some soul. What have we not had? Country. Thank you. All right. So we're going to get some country going, but I need an accessory, Gabe. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So y'all got to clap along. Hit it. Tell them your favorite country song. morning Northland family I can guarantee you this that is something you cannot get in any other church in Orlando come on can we give our worship team a big hand so creative love it well if we've not had the pleasure of meeting yet my name is Dan Young I'm the executive pastor of next gen for our children's ministry and this morning thank you to that one person my one fan in the room appreciate that <laughs> Um, that threw me off. Uh, so this morning we are doing our, our baby dedications. Really one of my favorite days uh, in church because we have families that understand the importance and the value of raising their children according to God's word. And that's what we're doing today. And these families here are going to make a commitment before their church saying, yes, I will honor the Lord in the way that I raise my children. So I want to introduce you to some folks this morning, starting on our far, my right, your left. Uh, we have Monica and Richard. Can we give them a big hand? And they're making a decision today to dedicate two of their children, Mila Bell and Ross Gabriel. And next we have Anne Lorraine and Kyle and they are dedicating their little guy, Eli. Can we give a big hand to Eli? Next, we have Christopher and Sharice, and they are dedicating Liam Daniel. Daniel, such a strong name, would you agree? All right, love it. And last and not least, we have our friend Charity here, and she is dedicating her two little ones, uh, Jessica and Joanna. So parents, I'm just going to ask you a few questions and you'll respond with the appropriate response. Hopefully it'll be I will or I do. If not, we'll talk again after service and figure out, you know, what might be going on there. Uh, but parents, do you receive your children with gratitude, acknowledging that they are a gift to you and your family from the Lord? All right, we're starting easy. All right. Do you commit to one another as parents, creating a stable environment in which your children can mature? And do you commit to be parents of personal faith, recognizing that your children are more likely to follow God's path for their life as it's modeled in your life and they observe it first within you? Do you commit to lead a faith-filled home that honors God in all of your relationships and in all of the choices that you make in spiritually growing your family. Yes. All right, now listen to this last one carefully. Do you commit to be parents with patience? How many parents in the room? 
Not always easy, right? But we need to be commit to be parents with patience, recognizing that with your strengths and your weaknesses, your desire to shape your child is a loving act that will require time, prayer, and God's favor in order for you to produce in your children what he and you both hope for. Yes. Amen. Can we stretch out our hand towards our families and let's cover them in prayer this morning. Father, we are so thankful for each and every one of these families. We pray a blessing over them in Jesus' name. God, we pray protection and provision and peace into their homes. God, let these little ones be raised up in a godly environment where at the earliest age they learn to seek you with all their heart, their soul, their mind, and their strength that one day these little lives will become spiritual champions as they endeavor to build your kingdom. And we give you thanks for them. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Can you give our friends and our families a big hand one more time? Bless you guys. Bless you guys. We'll just make our way right here. Well, let's give it up for our families one last time. And I really would like to know, and so we can shout it out in the count of three, what your favorite country music is. All right, so your song. Ready? One, two, three. Friends in low places. So... Which is why, like, I, you know, one of the things I, I like to spiritualize and sanctify some things, but the whole idea of friends in low places is that, hey, we're all sinners. So uh, Jesus reaches down to the very depths of low places, and he brings you to the top of where he is. Amen. So, uh, but I also, one of the things I did this past week is I tried to, I actually tried to audition to do the country jingle, but Lori turned me down. And so uh, you don't get to hear it. So, but you can turn... Turn to your neighbors like, uh, you missed something really, really good. So, uh, all right, well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. We are in our final installment of our Engage series, Commission, where we've been looking at what does it truly mean to engage in a local church who participates in God's mission. And so I got a lot of ground to cover, so I'm gonna jump right in, and I'm gonna give you the main point. Here's the main point. Jesus commissions his church. So he tasks his church, he commands his church from everywhere to everywhere to share and show the good news. Now, what is the good news? That through Jesus' death and resurrection, he is making all things new. So that's what he has tasked his church with. He has commissioned. He has sent us in this command that we are to share verbally and show demonstrably that through his death and resurrection, he is making all things new. That is what it means to be commissioned. So with that, will you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word, Acts chapter 2. So Acts chapter 2, we read every day the church continued to meet together in the temple courts. There's your connect. Uh, they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. There's an element of cultivate. They're meeting together in smaller groups in homes and then praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. So they're constantly sharing the good Good news of Jesus, his death, his resurrection, how it's in him. He's making all things new and they're putting out that invitation and people are receiving Jesus as Lord, God, and King. So let's pray. Father, we pray that you would be glorified. 
Uh, Jesus, we continue to pray that you would build up your church, that our, our very existence would revolve around your kingship, uh, your glory, uh, spirit. Uh, we pray that you would go to work in us and among us and that you will give us eyes to see, ears to hear, a mind to understand, a heart to receive what you have for us as we dive deep into your word, understanding the depths of commission. For it's in your name we pray, our King, and all God's people said, amen. amen. You may be seated. All right, so I'm going to answer four questions for us this morning, and you'll see where all of this is headed to at the very end. So question number one, why does Jesus commission his church to neighbors and nations? So the church is from everywhere to everywhere, meaning it's from your neighbor to the nation. So why does Jesus commission? Why does he task the church with taking this good news to the ends of the earth? Here's the simple answer is because God is on mission. So because God is on mission, Jesus is going to commission his church to participate in that mission. Now, if you have been here as long as I have, you have heard me talk about there are three iterations or versions of God's mission. And I want to give those to you real quick. And so some of this will be a recap to some of you. Some of it will be new. All right. So God has he has one mission, but it takes three different versions or iterations. So iteration number one of God's mission is this. God is on mission to create a people for himself to reflect his glory in all spheres of life. Well, where do you see that iteration? In the garden. So Genesis 1, Genesis 2. God is going to create the cosmos, the created order. He is going to create a garden. He's going to put Adam in the garden first. Then he's going to put Eve and we read that they are image bearers. God created them in his image, meaning that God wants to reflect, he wants his glory reflected from Adam and Eve. And so how that glory is going to be reflected is how they are to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and exercise dominion. So those five things that Adam and Eve were to do, you can condense them down into three easy words, relate, create, and operate. So as Adam and Eve related with one another and God, they would reflect God's glory, his characteristics, his attribute, his nature, his kingdom, and then create. They were to take the raw materials that God had just created, and they were to make something of the world. They were to enhance the created order. I mean, just think about that. I mean, he wants them, Adam and Eve, to go to work, imaging him in their work, and then operate everything, time, talents, treasures, ev everything in the creation created order and in their life was to operate under his lordship. And so as they did that, as they, as they would relate, create, and operate, God wanted them to expand the boundaries of Eden, which is why I put directional arrows. And so we did this a few weeks ago. Now, the whole idea of them expanding the, the Garden of Eden was so that God's glory would fill the earth through his image bearers. Because where God's glory, where his presence was, what was concentrated was actually in the center of the garden. So as they would expand the garden, they would have basically this earth-filled temple with worshipers reflecting God. Now, just so that you know that I'm not crazy or I'm not the only one who thinks this way. G.K. Bill, uh, he writes this. So a theologian scholar, temples in the ancient world had images of the God of the temple placed in them. Adam was that image placed in Eden temple. Uh, his task was to fill the earth with God's glory as a divine image bearer along with his progeny as image bearers. And so this seems to be the implication in Genesis 1, 28. Now, he was to expand, Adam was to expand the borders of Eden, the place of God's presence. Adam and his progeny were to expand Eden's borders until they circumscribed the earth so God's glory would be reflected throughout the entire world as image bearers. Like, that's what God wanted. 
And then I want to give you another little piece of the puzzle in Genesis 2, because this will make sense at the very end of this message. But in Genesis 2, 10, here's what we read. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. So the place where God's presence was concentrated, there was a river that flowed from Eden and it was separated into four headwaters. So I just want you to know that this idea of water coming from the throne, a water coming from the presence of God was to water because water brings life. And so God, God's presence brings life and the river flowed from where his presence was concentrated. But we know what happened with Adam and Eve, don't we? Okay. They got the boot. That's why they sad faces. They got, they got the boot. Now you have hell on earth because Adam and Eve sinned. They disobeyed. Listen, disobedience, sin brings hell on earth. It brings chaos. It brings brokenness. It brings messiness. And so what you see is now the entrance of the kingdom of man. And when you read in your Bible, Egypt and Babylon are prototypes of the kingdom of man. And so with this picture, there is a second iteration of God's mission. And the second iteration of God's mission is that now God is on mission to redeem. He's got to save a people. He's got to deliver a people. He's got to ransom a people. He's got to purchase the sin debt back from, from people so that they can be whole again, so that they can be repaired, so that they can be forgiven. So God is on mission to redeem a people for himself to reflect his glory in all spheres of life because now now, if you think about a mirror that has been shattered, it does not give off a perfect whole reflection. So here's the thing. Mankind still is going to relate, create, and operate, but they're going to do so in a fragmented, distorted, and chaotic way. So what God has got to do, he's got to redeem and make that mirror, make the image bearer whole again so that we might properly, properly reflect who he is. Now, where do you see this, Joshua? You actually see this early on in Genesis 3. So Genesis 3, 15, right after Adam and Eve sin, God is going to issue consequences, but he's going to say this. And I, God, will put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman, and between your offspring and hers, and he will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. I don't know if you've ever seen this image around Christmas time, but you have Mary, who is pregnant with a child, Jesus, and you have Eve, who's caught in her sin. So you have the serpent entangling her, but you have Mary stomping on the head of the serpent. Why? Because her offspring, Jesus, who is God incarnate, fully God, fully man, he was the offspring that was promised in Genesis 3.15 to reverse the curse of sin, to bring about redemption, and to restore all of creation. And so that's where you see in Genesis 3.15, right after Adam and Eve sin, God's promising redemption. He's promising restoration. You also see this in Genesis 9. So Noah and his family, they are saved from God's wrath. God wipes out the human population because of their sin. But he saves Noah and his family. So after Noah gets off the boat, then what what we read in chapter nine is very similar to what God tells Adam in chapter one. So then God blessed Noah and his sons saying to them, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. The fear of dread of you will fall on all the beasts of the earth, birds in the sky, every creature that moves along the ground, fish in the sea, they are given into your hands. Just as for you, Noah, I want you to be fruitful and increase in number, multiply on the earth and increase upon it. So once again, there's this idea of I'm going to redeem humanity through you, Noah, and your family, and I'm going to give you what I gave 
Adam, but I'm, I'm, I'm saving you. I'm delivering you from the penalty of sin, and I want you to start all over. Well, as we fast forward through the Genesis narrative, you will come to Genesis chapter 10, and you will be like, uh, where did all of these nations come from? Like, you, you, you just had one language, but now you're having like all of these different ethnicities, languages, where did they come from? Well, you have to read Genesis 11 to understand where the table of nations came from. Now, what happened is when Adam and Eve got kicked out of the garden, here's what you're going to read in the Bible, is that the human population, they began to move eastward. Anytime in the Old Testament you see this direction of moving eastward, it is away from God. So the human population is moving eastward, and they settle in this land of Shinar, which is around present-day Iraq. And what they do is that they come together, they had one language, and they're starting to communicate and go, hey, let's build a city and a temple or tower that reaches to the heavens, and the reason why we're building this city is for our own namesake, for our own glory. Not the Creator's glory, not God's glory, but for our own glory. And so here's what you have in Genesis 11. God comes down to the city that they're building, and he confuses their language. So no no longer are they able to communicate well with one another in building the city, building this tower. Now it's really a messed up communicative you know, relationship that they have with one another. And now they are scattered throughout the world. Then in Genesis 12, you have the third iteration of God's mission. So the third version, and here it is. God is on mission to redeem a people, one people, from all people to reflect his glory in all spheres of life. Now, how is God going to do that? Well, there's a man living in this region by the name of Abram. And God's going to reveal himself to Abram, say, basically, I'm going to save you, buddy. And through you, I'm going to make a great name, a great nation. And through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. But here's what I, I want from you. You got to leave and you got to go westward. What's the, what's the direction westward? What is it to? It's towards God. Eastward is moving away from God. Westward is moving towards God. So Abraham is going to move towards God to a land that God will show him which is where you get the idea of the promised land. The promised land was what God promised to Abraham and his descendants, and it's going to be from Abraham. God is going to create one people from all peoples. Now, what's interesting is in Galatians chapter three, here's what the apostle Paul says about Genesis 12. He says, understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles. Who are Gentiles? Well, here, if you are not a Jew, you are a... So if you're not an ethnic Jew, you are an ethnic Gentile. So God foresaw that, that there would be a justification of the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel, the good news to Gentiles in advance to Abraham that all the nations will be blessed through you. So, so the apostle Paul, I mean, uh, centuries, centuries later is looking back on what God promised Abraham and said that was the good news to the Gentiles. And from Genesis 12 to the very Last chapter in the book of Revelation, you see this iteration come to life in the pages of Scripture. Now, I'm going to give you about eight different slides with, with passages, Scripture passages, that show this iteration of God's mission. And I want you to know that this list is not exhaustive. But you're going to feel like it's exhausting, but I don't want you to get exhausted in looking at these lists. I want to make the point, and here it is. So Genesis 18, Abraham is going to intercede for Sodom and Gomorrah. God had called him to be a blessing to the world, and so now he's going to intercede for wicked and evil Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, Genesis 47 through 50, you're going to have Joseph. He comes on the scene. He's sold into Egypt, sold into slavery 
slavery in Egypt, but he rises to become a prince of Egypt and God uses him to not only save the Egyptians, but the entire region from a famine. Exodus 7, 5, uh, later on, when Israel becomes oppressed there in Egypt, God is going to send Moses to Egypt to tell Pharaoh to let his people go. But there's another reason why God is sending Moses and delivering his people out of Egypt so that the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. After all of the plagues and the miracles that God does through Moses, here's what's, here's what's fascinating. When they're leaving, when they're leaving Egypt in Exodus 12, 38, many other people went up with them. Who? Went up with who? Israel. They're like, uh, we're going with your God. We just saw what your God did. Your God wiped out the gods of Egypt. We coming with you, all right? And and then Exodus 19, this this idea of the kingdom of priests. So Israel would be a kingdom that mediated between the glory of God and his presence and the nations. Next list, Joshua 2 and Joshua 6. You have Rahab. She is a Canaanite. She is a non-Israelite and she confesses Yahweh as king and and she's saved. Ruth, in the book of Ruth, you have Ruth. She is a Moabite. She confesses Yahweh. She's saved. 1 Samuel 17, 47. That's where you get the story of David and Goliath. I want you to understand that David did not slay Goliath because he was courageous and brave. David slew Goliath so that the Lord might be known among the nations. So uh, chapter 17, verse 47. Here's what, here's what David says. All those gathered here here will know the Lord saves because they would say it's not about me it's about he and he's the one that you need to know then first Kings 8 Solomon prays this dedication prayer to the temple. And in that dedication prayer, he prays for foreigners outside of Israel that they would hear of the Lord's great name. They would come to his temple and they would pray and that the Lord would hear their prayer. Here's the next list. You got Jonah is sent to proclaim repentance to Nineveh. Habakkuk 2.14, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. Isaiah Two, that that here's what God's going to do. He's going to establish his temple on the highest of mountains and all the nations will stream into it. If you remember a few weeks ago, I talked about how Jesus is the ultimate temple. And this idea that Jesus sends his people out to all nations, to make disciples of all nations. Here's what you have. You have this picture that Jesus is now the cosmic, truer temple that who now every tribe, every nation, every tongue, every people group is streaming into Jesus, the highest, highest temple of God. And then you have Isaiah 42, 6, that that God's going to make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. Are you overwhelmed yet? I hope not. Here we go. Jeremiah 29, God sent Israel into exile, yes, because of their disobedience, but it was also for a dual purpose so that the world might know. Because you have Daniel 3, God is glorified throughout Babylon. Daniel 4, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, he exalted the Lord as the one true high God. Daniel 6, you have King Darius. He issues a decree to his, his entire empire that they would fear and revere the God of Daniel. Overwhelmed yet? Hope not. Matthew 1. So now we get into the New Testament. Matthew 1, the genealogy of Jesus has multiple Gentiles in it. Matthew 2, you have Gentile magi, wise men that see a star and they they, they remember a prophecy because of Daniel and his mark on history centuries earlier and they travel 800 to 1,000 miles to see the newborn king. You have Matthew 4, Jesus begins his ministry in the region of the Gentiles. Matthew 24, Jesus says the gospel of this kingdom will be preached to all nations. Then Matthew 28, this is what's fascinating. Jesus now gathers up new Israel. That's what that's his disciples, that's what they really represented on a mountain and he gives them the great commission. Now they are going to be the ones that catapults the fulfillment of Genesis 12, that through Abraham and his descendants, God will bring blessing to all of the world. Overwhelmed yet? Hope not. Here we go. Luke 24. 
Forgiveness, here's what Jesus says, forgiveness of sins will be preached to who? All nations. John 20, 21, Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, I am now sending you. Acts 1, 8, you're gonna be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. This is Jesus talking. And then Paul, here's what Paul's going to do. He's gonna pick up and he's going to, you can go to the next slide. And then Romans 15, here's what Paul writes. It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where? Where Christ isn't known. And then Colossians 1, 6, this gospel of Jesus, his death and the resurrection is bearing fruit and growing throughout where? The whole world. And then 1 Thessalonians 1, 8, the Lord's message rang out from you, from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become what? Known everywhere. One more, here we go. Revelation, last book of the Bible. Chapter five, chapter seven. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, Jesus, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. In Revelation 7, 9, then he looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne. So why are we commissioned? Because from the very beginning, the nations have been on the heart of God. So if you want to know why the church does both local and international missions, is because we truly believe that we have been commissioned from everywhere to everywhere, from neighbor to nation. Yeah, amen. You can give, yeah, you... There's a lot of Bible, a lot of Bible, drinking from a fire hose, but it's okay. You can gulp it down. Here we go. Number two, how does the church engage in the commission? All right, so now we know why we, we are sent. So, so how? Well, this is where I really want to use Abraham as the poster child. I want to use Abraham's call as the framework of the cost of mission. Now, Genesis 12, now I've referred to it uh, quite a bit. So here it is, Genesis 12, 1 and 3. A Abram, he's minding his own business. God reveals himself to Abra Abram, and here's what he says. The Lord has said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. So this is the statement of cost. This is what it's going to cost Abraham. Then God says, this is what I'm gonna do though. If you embrace the cost, this is what I'm going to do. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. Just FYI, Abram and Sarah, they had no children at this point. And could you imagine this God revealing himself to you and saying, hey, through you, I'm gonna make you into a great nation. And he's probably thinking, ha, ha, I ain't even got a kid. How's that gonna happen? And Sarah, she getting old. Do you not see how old she is? I mean, like, but God's gonna do something. If you will just embrace the cost of mission, God's going to do something. And then verse three, here's the other, other cost. But I'm gonna bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse and all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. You, you wanna know what the cost is of participating in God's mission of being commissioned? Here it is. You got a new God. You see, Abraham, he was a polytheistic worshiper. So at that time, he's worshiping a plethora of gods. But the one true God shows up, reveals himself, begins to communicate and tells him, listen, I need you to leave. And so here's the thing, is that if Abraham is going to participate in God's mission, if he is going to give the cost of being commissioned, he's got to leave all the other gods behind. Hey, church, listen, we might not have little idols like Abraham had at that time in his life, but I want you to understand that we are idol, we are idol worshipers by our very sinful nature now. So when you come to Jesus, you put away the idol of sexuality. You put away the idol of power. You put away the idol of consumerism. You put away the idol of relationships because now you only have one true king and his name is Jesus. If you're going to embrace the cost of mission, okay? 
So, so you, got a, you got a new authority. You got a new authority who's gonna tell you what to do. Now here's the thing, if you don't want that authority, sit your butt down at home and say, I ain't moving. But when you trust Jesus, he's in charge and you aren't, okay? Then, but he's gonna give him a new identity. I, and here's what, here's, what, here's what God says to Abram, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna make you a nation. I'm gonna turn you into a name. So, so now, with those of us who have followed King Jesus, not only is he our king and ultimate authority, but he's also our identity. We are embedded in him so that when God looks at us and hopefully when other people look at us, they don't see us, they see the new identity that we are being shaped and conformed into what Jesus is making us into. We have a new identity, but also a new family. What, what does God tell Abram? Leave your family. Leave your family. Why? Because I'm, I'm about to make a new family. Like we are, and I want to stress this, we are brothers and sisters. We are the new family of God, the new human race, and then a new direction. So, so God's going to call Abram westward, not eastward. Listen, when you, come to, when you came to Jesus, when I came to Jesus, we no longer went our own direction. We no longer did what we wanted to do, when we wanted to do it, how we wanted to do it. No, no, no. We are now following his direction. Where do you want us to go? What do you want us to do? How do you want us to live? And then this is, this is fun, a new purpose. Did you see verse three? That you are going to exist not only for my glory, but you're going to exist for the blessing of the nations. See, that's foreign. It's absolutely foreign throughout world civilization. Like I've been watching a docu-series on Alexander the Great. He wanted to conquer everybody. He wanted to bless people. But, but here, Abram, he's gonna be turned into an incredible great nation with a great name, but with the posture to bless. So, so, so if we're going to embrace the cost of participating in God's mission of being commissioned by Jesus, we have a new purpose. And that purpose isn't a self-centered person, but it is now a selfless centered person centered around the glory and the renown of our King, whose name is Jesus. And Jesus is actually going to pick up on this, right? So this is why he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. So this is before he actually takes up his cross. But you do realize why Jesus took up his cross, because that was the reason why the father sent him. God, the father sent God, the son, Jesus to die on a cross so that we might be redeemed. So the cross was the ultimate act of obedience, but the cross was for the opening of salvation to the nations. So if Jesus tells us, his people, his followers, I want you to daily take up your cross and follow me, what is he saying? At the core of what you do daily is you listen and obey me, but I promise you I will always posture you to and for others. I know that's not what you wanted to hear, but when you go to work tomorrow, listen, you ain't going first and foremost to get a paycheck. No, you first and foremost going because that is a way that you glorify God in this world. But second, you are also looking, how can I bless others through what God has called me to do in my work? If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, you can't be my disciple. Why? Because I'm building a new family here. And so if you follow me, you're part of this new, dysfunctional, who I'm making into functional and flourishing family. Yes. Then what we see, there was somebody that came to Jesus and said, I'll follow you. And Jesus said, <laughs> you know, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Listen, you're going to follow me. There, there's there's, there's going to be times where you feel like it's you know, unstable. And then another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, well, hey, uh, you need to follow, you, follow me now. Le leave the dead to bury their own dead. Listen, there is a cost to following me. I, listen, 
I feel like we have watered down following Jesus in the 21st century here in Christianville, America. Listen, if you go back to scripture, every time God calls somebody, it costs them something. So if you are following Jesus and it hasn't cost you anything, you might not be following the right Jesus. Good morning, I love you, happy Sunday. <laughs> so, all right, number three, number three. All right, the, the third question. I'm about to, about to geek out on you, okay? I hope you're all right with that. What are the two forces or sides of commission? And just so that you know, I mean, I have a PhD in this, so that's why I'm like, I like to nerd out on this stuff, but I'm about to give you two sides of commission or two forces of commission. The first is a centripetal force. You didn't know you were gonna have a science lesson this morning, but... Centripetal force, everybody say centripetal. So there's this drawing in force. There's this magnetization of God's people. Now, and you're going to see it in the Ecclesia, that's Jesus' church, and you also see it in the Old Testament in Israel and the Promised Land. God is going to give Israel a promised land. He's going to tell them to connect with one another and him. He's going to give them laws to cultivate life. He's going to give them laws also to care for one another in the promised land. Same goes in the New Testament with Jesus' church. He is now, he is building up his temple, the church. And when we gather for corporate worship, that is the temple of God coming together to connect with one another as we connect with our King. And so that's why we connect with one another and God. But then he's going to tell us to be cultivated in Jesus's image. And the way we are cultivated more into Jesus's image is embedding ourselves into community. So identifying with Jesus's community, we're going to submit to his word, his authority, let his word Word, give shape and formation to our life in the context of his community and he's going to give us some spiritual disciplines like prayer and Bible reading and journaling and sacrificing like our time, our talents and our treasures like these spiritual disciplines that give shape and definition to our faith and that's the way we're going to cultivate but then he's also going to tell us to care for the resources that God provides those so the people and the resources that God brings to us so creation care how we care for resources, then our need care, because we know that we're still marred by sin. We still live in a sinful world and it's broken. And so there's gonna be times where in the body there are a lot of needs that are the manifestation of the brokenness that has been caused by sin. And what God wants his people to do are, are to meet the needs of the body. And then we have this family care that we see one another as brothers and sisters in Christ and then temple care. And what that means is, is when the church comes together corporately, God, if you follow Jesus, the spirit of God has given you gifts to serve the body, to encourage the body, to edify the body as Jesus builds the body up. And here's what happens is that when we connect, cultivate and care the way God has always wanted his people to do, we act as a magnet a centripetal force drawing the nations into this new human race. Because what? They're marred in brokenness. Their life is messy. Their life maybe is confused. They don't know their direction. They don't know their purpose. Maybe some, some things relationally aren't all together, but then they will see this beautiful body who, yes, is not perfect, but is being sanctified, is being shaped and formed into the beauty and the glory of King Jesus, they're going to see this body and they're going to be attracted to this body. And I'll just say this, when you look at the church here in America, I don't even want to put a number on it, but it's not that attractive because I think we failed. We've made church, we've made the people of God everything but what God wanted her to be about. And then here, here's, the, here's the other force. It's the centrifugal force. Everybody say centrifugal. So you got centripetal, you got centrifugal. Centri centrifugal is this going out. So it's this being sent. 
So centripetal is this drawing in, centrifugal is this going out. So what, what are we sent out to do? Well, you actually see this in, ex, in exile. So in the Old Testament, Israel was sent into exile, into Babylon. You're gonna see it there and you're gonna see it throughout the pages of the New Testament. Here's what God wants his people to be sent out to do. To be a partnering piece, a preservative piece, and a prayer and proclamation piece. Let me explain. Partnering peace. So when God sent Israel into Babylonian exile, they didn't know what to do. They're away now from their homeland. And they're like, uh, can, can somebody give us direction here? And so God, through the hand of Jeremiah, gives them direction. And here's what God tells the exiles living in Babylon. Here's what he tells them to do. I want you to seek the peace and prosperity of the city of Babylon. Now, I want you to think of how foreign that is. This, this is the same Babylon, the same king that invaded Israel, that killed their family, their friends, and took them into exile. Yet, God tells them, I want you to partner with Nebuchadnezzar. So when you see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when you see Daniel in the pages of the book of Daniel, when they are working in the government, in the Babylonian government, that is a partnering peace. So when you look at what do, we, what do we do here today as we are in exile? Well, we're gonna, we're gonna find ways to partner with the greater city, with the greater community. That's why we have a good working relationship with the city of Longwood. We are partnering with apartment complexes. We are partnering with public schools. Like this is a way that we're gonna partner for the common good, for the flourishing, for the shalom, for the peace of the city in which God has called us. Us. That's why you go to work and many of you go to work and you don't even have a Christian around you. You are partnering with them for the peace of that company as that company seeks to work for the common good of the culture. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to have a partnering peace. So the next is a preservative peace. There's a story and you can find it in Daniel chapter 2 where Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar, he has a dream that greatly disturbs him. And he calls together all of his wise men or magi, who usually are the ones who would, uh, who would interpret dreams. And so he says, hey, listen, I'm not gonna give you the dream because I want you to tell me the dream because if you can tell me the dream, then I know that your interpretation is correct. Well, all of the wise men, they look at each other and like, are you serious? This guy, oh my gosh, who, who knows dreams? And so they're like, oh, Nebi, King Nebi, uh, we, we don't feel comfortable with trying to, uh, you know, trying to conjure up whatever the dream is that you had and then give you an interpretation. So, so King Nebi, he is ticked off. He's hot. He's so hot that he wants to kill all the wise men. Well, there's one guy by the name of Daniel who is part of the wise men group. So he hears Nebuchadnezzar wants to wipe out all of the magi and the wise men. And so he goes and says, hey, Nebi, please listen to me here. Uh, give me 24 hours and I will give you your answer. I will tell you your dream and I'll give you the interpretation. So Nebuchadnezzar says, all right, you got 24 hours. Daniel goes back to his room and he begins to seek the God of heaven for revelation, for understanding. And God gives him that revelation, gives him Nebuchadnezzar's dream. So within 24 hours, Daniel goes back to Nebuchadnezzar and he says, let me tell you your dream that you had. Here's the interpretation. And see, what you see with Daniel is that he works as a preservative piece because he tells Nebuchadnezzar, do not kill any of the wise men. I'll give you what you want. And see, what we want to do as the people of God, we want to be salt. We want to be a preservative. That's one of the reasons why we launched Mercy Road here is that it is an outward missional platform to care for the brokenness and the needs in our region. Why? Because God wants us to be a preservative piece peace, to preserve life, to be those who care for life, regardless of their age, regardless of what's going on in their life, a preservative, salty peace, and then prayer and proclamation. So God wanted them in Jeremiah 29 to pray for the peace. Uh, the the New Testament teaches us to pray for all of those who are in authority, to, to be at peace with all, if at all possible. And then also in the Old Testament, you have this idea 
where Nebuchadnezzar, he builds this image of himself and he issues this de decree throughout the entire Babylonian empire. Whenever you hear the musician sing and the instrumentalist play, you are to bow down and worship this image. So on the very first day this happened, there were three young Israelites that didn't bow down to the image. Shadrach, Meshach, and a billy goat. <laughs> Just make sure you're paying attention. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're like, oh, we, we ain't bowing down. And so they were gonna be thrown into the fiery furnace. And so as they're thrown into the fiery furnace, you had the people who threw them into the fiery furnace, they died. And they actually live. They live so much, in fact, that as, as the people look into the fiery furnace, they don't see three men, they see four men. And one looks like the son of God. Don't, don't miss this. This idea of proclamation peace is that, hey, God's people will never be assimilated into the pagan culture in which they are sent in. They will be distinctive. And their distinctiveness and their allegiance to Yahweh will be the proclamation that there is no other God but Yahweh and his name is Jesus Christ the King. And, and see what we're, what we're seeing today is there are, there's a lot of capitulation in the church today to be assimilated into pagan progressive secular America. Don't do it. Don't do it. Because this is a way, this is a way that we proclaim peace, that peace is not found here in America. Peace is not found in what you can consume. Peace is not found in how much money you make. Peace is not ultimately found in the relationships that you have. Peace is ultimately found in the fact that Jesus through his death and resurrection is making you new and all things new. That's ultimate peace. So partnering, preservative, prayer and proclamation and put it all together. Here's the mad scientist in me. Put it all together. You got the centrifugal and the centripetal force at work. That's what he's called. So if you're going to embrace this commission, if you're gonna embrace these two forces of commission, here's what you're gonna to have to do. You're gonna to have to embrace these, these terms right here. You're gonna to have to embrace discipleship, evangelism, and exile and suffering. Discipleship, learning what it means to be human and part of the new human race after the image and likeness of Jesus. I was doing premarital counseling last night at Agave Azul because man, I love me some Agave Azul. Get the Monterey, it's a cheese shell. Oh, it's awesome, mm, I'm getting off track. But I'm sitting there doing some premarital counseling and the, 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 the guy at the kind of the end, he's like, you know, when we started this a few months back, I thought, man, this premarital stuff, this counseling stuff, it's just gonna be boring. You're just gonna ask me just a lot of questions that go down the list, but oh my gosh, th this has been so enlightening. I said, well, it, it, here's the thing. I said, because all we've been doing in this premarital counseling stuff is discipleship, learning what it means to be human, to be, to be a man, to be a woman, to be a husband, to be a wife after the image and likeness of Jesus as it intersects your marriage. That's all, that's all we've been doing. And they're like, oh, never, I never even thought about it that way. And I'm like, oh yeah, that, that's true discipleship. And then evangelism is inviting people into the good news story of King Jesus, who through his death and resurrection is making all things new. So, so evangelism is an invitation. Evangelism, you should never be mean or, or angry when you are evangelizing. That, that, that defeats the point. You, you should not, I mean, here's the thing. If you want to stand on the street corner, I mean, you do that if you want to. I'm going to tell you that's not effective because that's ultimately evangel you know, evangelism according to Jesus. Jesus isn't standing on the street corner saying, turn or burn. No, here's what he's doing. He is centrifugally and centripetally being beautiful, being sent out to be a partnering, a preservative, a proclamation piece. But then he's going to invite people into this good news story See, here's the thing about evangelism. We got to do the dirty work of understanding the messiness of people's life. We got to do the dirty work of understanding where they are broken because I promise you, people are different and they have different manifestations of brokenness in their life. But if we can ever do the dirty work of understanding where they are, we can do the glorious work of inviting them into the good news story that through Jesus' death and resurrection, he can make them new in that area. So that, that's evangelism. And then here, here, here are two others, exile and suffering. 
Listen, I love, I love living in America. There's so many blessings of living in America, but you hear me all the time saying this, this is not our home. We are just exiles. We're just passing through. We're waiting for Jesus to come back. We're waiting for the new city to come. We're waiting for the consummated kingdom where everything will truly be made new. We're just exiles. And then suffering, suffering. I get it, man. I was talking to somebody right before this gathering. Oh my gosh, life is filled with sufferings. But as the people of God, please hear me. These sufferings are the birth pangs of glory. They're the birth pangs of glory. See, see women, you know, you know this, we've given birth. There's a lot of pain, but glory is coming. You're gonna hold your baby. Hey, hey, here's the thing, glory's coming, city's coming. But right now we just gotta, we, we've got to embrace discipleship and evangelism, exile and suffering. All right, so uh, here we go. Where, uh, the last, last question, here it is, last question. Where is Jesus's commission going? Where is it going? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. Let me put up an image. So Revelation 22, that is the last chapter of the Bible. Now, we started Genesis, we end in Revelation. There is a 1500 year gap from when Genesis was written to when Revelation was written. And here's what John writes. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the what? <laughs> Who's sitting on the throne? Jesus. What's flowing from his throne? Water. What's so ginormous that it covers both sides of the water? the tree of life. And that tree of life will bring the healing of all the nations that trust Jesus Christ as king. That's where this commission is going. So as you can see, uh, the church is from everywhere to everywhere because God is on mission to redeem a people from all peoples to reflect his glory in all spheres of life. Here's three big facts that you need to know about God's mission today. Did you know that America is in the top three of the largest mission fields in the world? In the world. The nations have come to us. And then also we have this segment of the population called the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, that is continuing to accelerate and to grow. And they have no religious affiliation. We are the third, we're in the top three largest mission fields. Two, there are 7,000 unreached people groups in the world, over 7,000 that have little to no access of this good news story. That's 42% of the world's population. There are 8 billion people in the world, 42% of the 8 billion have little to no access of this good news story. And then the third is that there are not enough laborers and resources, meaning, that God's people have not taken it that seriously. To say, listen, I, we'll step up, we'll step up. So I'm ready to close and I'm gonna close with two questions and here they are. Why do these seas matter? Josh, why do these seas matter? Well, first, this is what God expects from his people. Like these seas are not optional when it comes to God. This is what God expects from his people. And then those who engage in these seas will experience deep joy and satisfaction. Listen, you're not gonna be perfect. I'm not gonna be perfect, but I promise you this, you're going to experience deep joy and satisfaction if you engage in what God has called you to engage in as his people. Churches that engage in these seas will experience a concentration of God's presence, power, and provision. Listen, I, I, and I know this as someone who has studied the church in North America, there are certain things that we could do to grow a church, but I promise you this, you do not want to grow a church apart from God's blessing. And here's what we know, we see this with Abraham. This is who he blesses. 
And this is where the concentration of his glory sits. Like, I don't want to move one minute in a direction where God's not there. I don't want one week to go by here in Northland where we are not moving in sync with the king himself. Because here's what we're going to see is that churches that engage in these seas will experience micro transformations of individuals, families, communities, cities, and regions where their presence is concentrated. Why? Because where they're engaging in the four seas, God's presence will be concentrated there and where his presence is concentrated, there are transformations. That's why these seas are so important. That's why we did this series. But then the second question tells you a little bit more of why we did this series. We did this series because we want to relaunch church membership. It's been years since Northland has had somewhat of an official membership. Actually, even when I came on staff, there were many, many staff that didn't even go to Northland. We changed that. Because how can you be a mission enterprise of God and not be on the same page missionally? And so we, we have taken care of that. But, but now we, we, we wanna relaunch church membership and here are, the pra- you know, so here are the practical levels of engagement that would happen in any church. And let me give those to you real quick. The, the first is exploring Christ or church. Maybe some of you here, you're exploring Christ. Let me tell you, he died for you, he rose again, and through his death and resurrection, he can make you new. All you need to do is confess Put your faith, your trust, your belief in Jesus as King, God, and Savior, and he will begin that process with you. So, but maybe you're exploring church. Is this the right church for you? And then you begin to attend the church. There are a lot of people throughout America right now, they're attending the church, and that's great. But God's called you to do more than just attend a church. He wants you to not just be involved, which here you might be involved in multiple C's. He actually wants you partnered with the church all the seas, not, not just one or two, all of the seas. So Josh, what is the, pra- well, what is the practical application of church membership in your opinion? Here, here it is. It's a way for you not to be a number, but part of the family. Like even here at Northam, as we, as we continue to grow, as we're butting up against the 2000 mark, like we don't want you to be a number. We truly want you to be part of the family. It's a way for us to see who's all in. Who's all in? Because just because we have 2,000 people attending on a weekend doesn't mean that all of you are in. It doesn't mean that all of you have aligned with us doctrinally. All of you have aligned with us in our mission of what we believe that God is on mission doing. It doesn't mean that you've all aligned with us in the vision of the four C's, Connect, Cultivate, Care, Commission. So membership is a way for us to see who is all in. Who can we count on? And then it's a way for us to know who has permitted us to care for them well. And I do think as we've talked in the day and age in which we live, it actually is good to get your permission to care for you well. And one of the things that we wanna do for every member is to assign you a person of care, like your own person that you know that you can pick up a call and you can activate the church in caring for you. God is doing something in our midst and I'm just flabbergasted at it. I mean, I truly am. And one of the things that we're going to have is four opportunities this year for you to join Northland. Now you might say, well, I've, I, I've been here, you know, since it started, Josh, you, you want me to go through the church membership? Yes, please. Yes, please. Um, and then maybe some of you are saying, well, do I have to be a member to, to be engaged or, you, you know, to attend? No, no, I just went over the levels of engagement. You do not have to be a member. But again, I gave you all the practical reasons of why we want you to consider being a member. But here's our first opportunity to go through a membership class. I'll be teaching all of the membership classes this year. But March 2nd from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m., you can register online at northlandchurch.net slash made for mission. And we'll be sharing more about that in the coming days. So with that, here's my last statement. Christ desires his followers to engage in one of his local churches. I want you to understand 
that Northland Church, we, we have not cornered the market on this. There are a lot of other good, healthy Christ-centered churches in the Orlando metro area. So, so you can engage in one of those. It doesn't have to be Northland, but Christ desires his followers to engage in one of his local churches as they participate in God's mission through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what he desires. And um, mm, I am so grateful. It truly is the honor and the joy of a lifetime to serve you, Northland Church. And I don't want to take for granted what God's doing. But what I'm sensing is that he is stirring our hearts and he is laying a solid, Christ-centered, biblical foundation to build the next season of ministry and mission on. And I wanna personally invite you to be a part of what he's doing. And all we are is just a tool. Let's pray, Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for dying for us, our King Jesus. And I pray that we would never take that for granted. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Will you stand with us? We're going to sing, build your church before we are sent out to be the salt and light of the world. those four C's, we make it much easier because it's what he's called us to do in building his church. Hey, a couple quick things before you're sent out. We will have a prayer team up here that if you need prayer, you have questions, you're wrestling with something you, you need to be ministered to, we'll have a prayer team up here ready to receive you. Second, cultivate. So now you see, now you see the, the lobby and the four C's, they weren't just decorative ideas, all right? They're the, they're the vision of what we do. We, we connect, we cultivate, we care, commission. So if you're in need of a life group, 
Like you can go see Cultivate. Like we actually have some women life groups representatives out there for you. If you're a woman, we have various kinds of women life groups. Hey, if you're a widow or you know of a widow, we just launched a widow's life group. It has about 12 or 15 widows and Marlene, I mean, unbelievable how we're caring for widows. So go check out Cultivate. Also commission. Uh, You can see all of the various trips that we have, mission trips coming up this year. Also, you can grab a bag and you can fill it with great little items, grocery items, canned items as we partner with a elementary school in the area as a way to partner, have a partnering piece there. So here's the benediction. Here it is. Father, our hands are open to be your people, to be the centrifugal, the sent ones, and the centripetal, the attractive ones that are living in light of our King. So we are sent out to be your hands and feet. Spirit, empower us to do just that. For it's in your name we pray, our King. Amen. You're sent out.